Welcome to those of you joining. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes and see. Um, I think we're waiting on just a few people and then we'll get started on our presentation. It looks like we just about have everybody, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. We appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, it's a little different this year than it was last year doing it in person. Um, everything seems to be virtual anymore, so we're glad to have you joining us. Um, we actually, I'm John Bentley, and I am the Director of Youth and Transition Services at the Ability Center, and Lisa Broski is our Youth Employment Coordinator, and the two of us will walk you through um, what we're hoping to have in store for you this summer and for the youth that you serve. Um, we are going to record today's session, so just so that you're aware, um, that way if you have any colleagues or anyone who is unable to join, um, they will be able to access it later. So this is just an overview of the staff that we have in our department. We have a pretty amazing dream team. Um, we have Shelby Phillips, who's our Youth Transition and Intake Coordinator. Leah Whitaker, who is our Youth Life Skills and Recreation Coordinator, Lisa Broski, our Youth Employment Coordinator, and then Angie Burton, who is our Youth Programs Manager, and she actually works out of our Brian office. So to get us started, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the Ability Center in general and our services. Um, if you have questions, we will have an opportunity at the end to open up the forum to those questions, so please make sure that you're including them in the questions box. Um, and feel free to ask questions generally about the center as well as about the programs that we're going to offer this summer. So the Ability Center has actually, we just celebrated our 100th birthday. Um, our mission really is to advocate, educate, partner, and provide services supporting people with disabilities to thrive within the community. Um, we're all about inclusion. And I'd say the biggest piece of our mission that has really shifted over the last year or two is really a focus on partnerships. Um, we really look to many of you in our community to really help enhance the services that we provide and to work collaboratively. It's really become a big focus of ours. So a lot of people um, are unaware that we actually serve seven counties in Northwest Ohio, um, Lucas obviously being our largest county, but we also serve Defiance, Fulton, Henry, and Williams out in Lafour County western region and then we also service ottawa and wood counties as well so one of our departments that we're really well known for is our advocacy department um, they are led by our attorney and advocacy director katie hunt thomas she has done quite a few things both at um, the local level the state level and they even have received national awards and recognition for their advocacy work. Um, they do a lot of systems advocacy, as well as um, some individual advocacy here and there, but they're really proactive in a lot of the advocacy work that they do in the community. They've worked very closely with um, different organizations such as the Metro Parks, the Mud Hens, um, to really look at their grounds and services and making sure that they're accessible to people with disabilities. We also have our assistance dogs program that's probably one of our more popular who doesn't love snuggling with some puppies. Um, so they actually have a volunteer program. They're always looking for volunteers. Um, families who are willing to foster puppies is a huge need and uh, puppy raisers. So that's part one component of their program, but they also um, train dogs that become service dogs for people with disabilities as well as therapy dogs. And they train um, individual therapy dogs as well as therapy dogs for schools, which is really cool. So um, there's quite a few schools throughout um, Ohio as well as some in Michigan who have therapy dogs in their schools.
We also have our community living program, and that's another really well-known one, um, as you can see by the picture of the ramp. So they do a lot of ramp builds, both wooden ramps, as you can tell by the picture, as well as aluminum. And they also do permanent and temporary ramps. Um, one of the things that people are unaware of is that we provide ramps to um, different organizations, such as um, Courageous Community Services, when they hold their award ceremony at the Pinnacle, we provide a ramp for the stage. So that's one of their services. They also have a um, home modification program, which is really, really um, popular and a very successful program. And they're going to be expanding, which is really exciting to provide um, independent living plan support and goal development to adults with disabilities, which is going to be huge for the Ability Center and for the community. So we're pretty excited about that. And then of course, my personal favorite, <laughs> not that I'm biased, is our youth department. So we currently work with youth ages 13 to 24 um, so really youth in transition, but this year we're going to be expanding our services to work with youth ages birth to 12 as well and their families. So um, we're thrilled to be offering those services. And I know we've met with some of you and worked with quite a few of you to look at what, um, what, what needs exist in that area. So when we talk about um, our youth with disabilities, we we really look at all of the areas that they need to be successful and independent. And so we not only look at independent living or life skills classes, we also consider recreation and socialization. We consider how we can support the school districts as they're doing their transition planning. How can we be a best support of what's happening outside of the school day? Um, I am a teacher by trade, a special ed teacher by trade, and I know that teachers are so incredibly busy during the day that it's a lot to add to your plate to think about what's happening outside of that as well. And so that's really an area where we can provide support. Um, we also obviously uh, develop employment skills as well, which is a huge component when we look at transitioning into independence. So one of the ways in which we help youth kind of work on those sk skills and developing those skills is through our life skills classes. And we offer classes in quite a few areas, um, employment preparation, transition, um, independent living. So we look at cooking and nutrition. We look at housekeeping, um, everything from medication management to keeping a schedule, um, financial management and budgeting, personal safety. As part of personal safety, we look at um, a huge one right now is internet safety, as well as um, internet etiquette and etiquette when it comes to virtual meetings and those types of platforms. And then another area that we look at in personal safety is developing a personal preparedness plan. So what will happen in an emergency? Who is your network? Who are your points of contact? Um, we offer courses in self-advocacy and we've actually expanded that um, into our youth leadership forum and program. So we're really excited to be able to offer that service now. We partner with Planned Parenthood for sex education courses, um, social skills development and teaching about boundaries, how to set boundaries while also respecting them is a huge um, skill that we really work on with a lot of our youth. Leadership development and then volunteering, which has also been a really successful class because it gives them a resume builder and some experience when they're looking at um, employment in the future. So that brings us to our Next Steps program, which we are very excited about. Um, Lisa is going to talk a little bit more about this. As you all know, things are ever changing. It feels like week to week, we're making different decisions on what things will look like. And as a result of that, we're actually currently planning really three different versions of Next Steps. Um, we'll look at our traditional and then a couple different almost hybrid versions. So Lisa will talk a little bit more about those, but just so that you are aware, and that way when you're working with parents and families, um, caregivers, you can let them know that we will obviously keep you posted as we go, but it's going to be kind of an evolving process. Thanks, Don. 
Um, yeah, so we're here to talk about the Next Step Summer Program in addition to YLF. So first, um, we'll focus on this one. And um, traditionally, it is, uh, we call it a six-week program, really it's five and a half weeks, but um, students or participants um, live on campus at the University of Toledo. Um, they're also paired with a local job site. Um, and this, the setup as far as the employment goes and the schedule kind of mirrors um, what OOD's summer youth program is like. And that's intentional so that consumers who are participating in OOD's summer youth program on the employment side can um, sometimes still participate in the independent living piece with us. Um, so we, we designed it purposefully so that they could do both if, if needed. And, um, you know, we've kind of, over the last couple of years, we've kind of um, switched our dates around a little bit and we kind of landed on the most successful um, way to do it is to align with um, one of the biggest summer youth vendors in our area, Harbor, um, with their second session of summer youth. So that has helped too, I think, um, to allow students to do both if, if they choose to. Um, but it, it's, it's geared towards um, juniors, seniors, or recent graduates um, who have goals of independent living, um, and also uh, competitive employment and potentially post-secondary education of some kind. So this is um, really uh, an all-inclusive kind of program where we focus heavily on independent living skills. I mean, they're living in the dorms um, with their peers um, and, you know, they go home on weekends, but they're spending the majority of their week for six straight weeks um, in away from their parents for most of which it's their first time doing that. So um, we've, We've evolved the program over the last couple of years and it's been great. Obviously last summer we were derailed and didn't get to hold it in the traditional sense. Um, but we're really hoping to, to do that in some capacity this year. Um, so there is traditionally a, a fee for Next Steps, um, a $500 fee, um, but there is a sliding scale that we use for um, families um, and we, you know, base that on household income. And we always like to say though, that we're not gonna turn someone away from the program um, just if, because they can't afford it. We, we will find a way to make it happen if necessary. Um, you know, there are scholarships available. We have, we get um, some grant funding too. So we, we don't want anyone to miss out on this experience um, if it's right for them, just because um, there's a fee associated with it. So, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, typically in the evenings, you know, we're doing independent living skills um, the majority of the time. You know, we, we like to allow them to socialize and um, choose, you know, recreation activities that they um, enjoy as well. But, you know, we're working on housekeeping, we're working on meal preparation and cooking and, and budgeting. Um, and time management is a big one. Um, that has really, I think this experience especially helps individuals with time management because they don't have a, a choice except to um, manage their time wisely. You know, we're there to, to guide them through it and to help them. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's, um, it's their responsibility to make sure that they're up and ready in the morning, um, ready for breakfast before work, um, that they have, you know, their, their lunch ready to go. Um, and their clothes are clean and you know staff is really great about um, about reminding everyone but again you know we're encouraging independence so that's the, the main goal of this um, okay. um, so first we want to talk about um, the staffing and safety and again the the staffing will depend on the type of program that we're holding this summer but this is just in general um, we wanted to reiterate that <clears throat> all of the youth department staff as well of, as overnight staff and any job coaches that we hire are all employees of the Ability Center. They're all subject to background checks, drug screens, and go through agency orientation. Um, so they you know, know the process for reporting um, incidents and um, you know, the overnight staff and um, job coaches are seasonal staff. Um, usually, so they know to report to one of um, the permanent staff if it's something that you know they're not sure how to do 
Um, all shifts overlap with each other, so there's always there's always a staff there in the dorms. Um, the only time that a consumer would not be around an ability center staff is if they um, if their employment experience is through OOD, in which case they would be um, supervised by the vendor staff at that point. Um, you know, or if they're writing tarps by themselves. But at any other time, you know, staff is always near. Um, so it's an independent living program, but you know, with with supervision, it's not like we just throw them to the wolves and, and leave them to their own devices. Um, so you know, it's it's a, a balance of giving them the independence, but also um, checking in with them. So. Um, also, as far as safety goes, participants review and sign a code of conduct prior to the start of the program. Um, so we go, we've we've really developed our code of conduct over the last couple of years um, and made it more thorough. And we we go through that, you know, step by step, and make sure everyone is clear. Um, and also, if they're an existing consumer, um, they would have also gone through an orientation um, throughout um, the the year and and also gone over the code of conduct, um, but we do it all together anyway, regardless, because, you know, we want to reiterate, um, because it's, um, they're, you know, not at home, but they're, they're living on campus. Um, safety is important. It's important to us and everyone involved, so. <clears throat> For those of you who are pretty familiar with our services, um, the orientation and the code of conduct is something new that we've actually, um, as far as doing the orientation, we've, just implemented that this year. Um, so any consumers who we do intakes with now um, will either go through one of the code of conduct and orientation reviews quarterly, or they'll work one-on-one -on -one with one of our staff to review it as well. Because um, it's something that we take really seriously as far as looking at, and it, it really covers a little more detailed what the expectations are as far as boundaries um, and what you know our expectations are as far as safety. And also, um, before the program begins, we hold uh, both a parent night and um, a student night. So the parent night, students and parents come and we go over the entire program, similar to what we were talking about at the info night, but we'll just get into more detail, um, more specifics at that point. Um, and that is usually held about a, a month or so before the program starts, but at that point, um, you know, we go over all of this with the parents as well. Um, so parents and students both are very aware of the setup of the program. And if they have any questions or concerns at that time, they're able to, to ask those. Um, and then, like I said, then we also do a student night where it's just the students. Um, and again, this is under normal circumstances where, you know, we would all be in person and the students would get to get to know each other um, a little bit before they're, you know, living in close quarters with one another. Um, but, you know, we, we pride ourselves on this program being unique and um, allowing the students to have that independence. Um, you know, as the Center for Independent Living, that's, um, you know, our number one, our number one goal. So um, it is a little bit different and it's not, you know, not every parent is comfortable with it and not every consumer is comfortable with it. And we understand that completely. Um, you know, each program is, um, it, it's different for everybody. So, um, but we definitely encourage anyone that is interested, you know, to, to learn more about it. And um, we're always willing and happy to answer any questions that anyone has about that. Um, in addition to going over the rules and regulations in the Code of Conduct, the rules are also rules and regulations. There's also a copy of that in every dorm room. Um, we keep a binder in there um, for staff. Um, and then there's information for uh, the participants as well to review at any time. Um, and something we do too with staff is we have uh, daily reports that staff can write in. There is an overlap, um, but you know when um, the morning staff comes in from the youth department, um, we always try to like you know read the report from the night before um, so we don't miss anything that maybe the overnight staff. Um, you know, is, isn't aware of. Um, so that's uh, been helpful too, as far as communication goes. And, you know, it's a tight knit group of staff here too. So we're always really good about communicating, but um, just having, you know, multiple different ways that we're communicating any student concerns 
with each other and then um, you know sending that on to uh, if needed if parents or other support staff um, we're happy to to do that as well um, and then of course with COVID that is bringing in a whole new level of um, safety protocols so again this is all going to be to be determined on what the program will look like um, but whatever we do if we have anything that's in person we're of course going to be following um, any recommendations or guidelines um, set forth by you know state and local government um, and just you know common sense what we feel is appropriate for the population that we work with so wearing masks social distancing holding um, sessions outside when available or appropriate um, and of course we don't know if we will require or have the capability to do any sort of testing it's just something that has been um, talked about as a possibility if uh, we we are able to do an in-person version of this <clears throat> Okay, so um, as Dawn mentioned, we have kind of laid out three um, options for what our program will look like. So the first is obviously the traditional program. So this will include an overnight component and an employment experience. Um, again, this will depend on the status of, of COVID at that time. Um, but we will make a decision on that in the spring. Um, you know, we're not going to have the luxury of, of waiting. You know, we wanna make sure that um, everyone that is a part of the program will know and, and is um, as far in advance as possible. Um, but if held traditionally, the program will run from July 7th through August 13th. Um, so the first week is kind of a half week. It's just uh, two and a half days really, but participants move into the dorms and they have group activities planned throughout the first couple days that focus on independent living and employment skills. Um, so that includes a panel of speakers. Our executive director usually speaks to them. We have some representatives from um, accessibility services. Um, so usually we try to have some students who have participated in the program before come and speak to them um, so they can ask questions that way. Um, we do a campus tour. Um, they get lessons on um, independent living skills. So, you know, like where the laundry is, how to do laundry, um, how to pick off a pick up after themselves or clean um, in the dorms. Um, and then we also um, take them shopping for appropriate um, clothing to wear at their work site. And you know, that's gonna uh, be different for everybody depending on where they're working. Um, but we also do you know, a budgeting lesson before that. Um, and we typically take them to um, uh, the salon to get their get their hair done or their nails done or get a, a cut a wash whatever is going to make them feel um, confident for starting um, starting at their job. Um, so week two, um, participants will return. To, they always return to the dorms on Sunday evenings. Um, Monday will be a day long training on professionalism. So those of you who are either from OOD or one of the vendors or are familiar with the program, typically um, in the past, this was a week long um, training. Um, however, they have adjusted that, which I think makes perfect sense um, to kind of condense that into one day and give them more um, experience actually in the workplace. So we have um, adapted our program to match that. That way, like again, if if a consumer is trying to do both programs, it, um, it mirrors that. Um, <clears throat> so they'll have the, the day long uh, training on professionalism and then Tuesday they would begin working. Um, so they go to work during the day and um, in the afternoons they come home. Um, and then we have activities planned throughout, uh, you know, different days of the week. There's usually a cooking night. There's a night that we go to the student rec center, and there's a night that we do um, a recreational outing. Usually Sundays are um, meant for laundry um, or any, you know, they can relax if they want. The group that's cooking that week will take them shopping. Um, and as far as uh, working goes, you know, we, we have different sites every year. We have some sites that um, are recurring, so we're very grateful for those. Um, I think one of the individuals that has hosted um, the last couple of years, I, th I think was registered for the class, so if you are, thank you. Um, so we're very grateful for those um, companies that host individuals to work. Um, we usually encourage TARPs if we can. Um, sometimes, you know, not everyone is, um, has access to TARPs 
for different reasons. So sometimes job coaches will transport or staff will transport to the work site. But if, if TARPS is an option, we definitely encourage that. That way, you know, it's one more step towards independence. Um, and then the, the last four weeks are kind of, um, you know, the same. They come to the dorms on Sunday. It's that same routine. They work Monday through Thursday. They get picked up on Thursday. Um, and then a couple years ago, we started doing a graduation ceremony on the last day, which was really cool. The first year we did it, our intern planned it, and it was, it was really great. It was, I think it was a great way to um, end the, the session. We had um, parents and students and staff and job coaches and even some individuals from the host sites came, and it was, it was a really great experience. So I think if, if able, you know, we will continue to do that um, in some format. Um, but you know the daily schedule is they we eat breakfast at the dorms. Um, the days they are not at work, we eat lunch um, in the the dining hall at the at the dorm too, and and dinner there as well. Um, but on the days they work, they take their lunch, which is made the night before as a group. Um, so you know we're encouraging them to do to to plan ahead on all aspects um, of their work day to make sure that they're prepared and then when they get home from work um, they get to relax a little bit we eat dinner and then like I said we have a different plan for each day of the week um, and you know they're allowed free time as well not everyone um, we usually have enough staff there so if not everyone wants to go to the rec center um, we have a staff stay back with those individuals that don't but we try to encourage them to go at least once and see what's there um, because there is a lot more you know some people who they think, well, I'm not into working out, so I don't want to go to the rec center. But there is, there's a lot more to experience there. Um, so, you know, we try to encourage um, at least trying it out. Um, and then we have a, a curfew for returning to the suites um, uh, by, I think, it used to be 11. I think we upped that a little bit last year. I think we upped that to 10. Um, that way they're in their own suites at least until 10. You know, we're not going to tell them they have to go to bed at a certain time. Again, this is about independence, but we will remind them they have to be up at a certain time. So they should, you know, they can make a, a wise choice there. Um, you know, but we want them to have that that time to prepare for the next day. And then staff can check in with all of the consumers before they leave and check in with the overnight staff when they arrive too. And again, there is a half hour overlap. Um, so plan B would basically be um, a sort of a, probably a day program. Um, we, we may try to modify the overnight component in some way. Um, again, this is all up in the air, um, you know, but to adhere to social distancing, there's a possibility that we could um, split up the overnight component. So, um, you know, into smaller groups so that maybe each group only gets a, a week of overnights. Um, but then we're, you know, if we have twin students, they're not all there at the same time. So um, those are just some ideas that we've thrown around, but you know, it may be a possible, it, it may be that we can't have the overnight, um, but in this plan B, we would still do the employment experiences and we would do independent living skills training. Um, the dates would remain the same. Um, so the schedule would really um, be similar other than they would go home in the evenings after some independent living skills. And we would, we would try to do as much as we could um, you know, outdoors, uh, again, you know, their Metro Parks is, is, is great. Um, they have a lot of great um, shelters that um, are usually accessible. So, um, or even uh, places on campus that would be available to us in the community or at the ability center, we have um, a large fenced in area behind the building. Um, so we have space that we could, you know, uh, I think that we could utilize um, to kind of make things a little bit safer if that's that's where we're at at that point. And then plan C would be <clears throat> um, a virtual format. Um, and this is what we did last year, although, you know, um, I think everyone kind of experienced this last year. No one really knew what the summer would bring. So um, at least this year we have a better handle on what a virtual program would look like. And I think that with more time to prepare, um, you know, we could still really provide a meaningful experience. Um, so this format obviously would not include an overnight or an employment um, component, um, but it would still include training on professionalism, independent living skills, um, some career exploration in order to set up some career mentorships. Um, and that is something we did last year and it was 
it was actually really cool. We had a lot of um, uh, such a variety of um, employers, employees from different companies that participated. Um, and, you know, we tried to make the matches as meaningful as we could based on consumer interests. But, you know, I think with more time to plan, I think we could make that even more meaningful. Um, so, at, you know, at the very least in this virtual plan, we will provide all of those um, services. And in this case, the dates would be changed just slightly. We wouldn't have that first half week um, just because that first um, half a week is, you know, really focused on things in the dorms and on campus. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily need that. Um, and the, as far as the times go, you know, we would try to do all that we could to um, coordinate and work around um, how OOD is planning their summer youth, which I know is, um, you know, everyone's kind of up in the air at this point. So um, that is going to be to be determined, but we want to make sure that um, if, a, if a participant does want to do both, that they're able to. Um, so we'll work with those other agencies to make sure that that um, is possible. Um, and the virtual sessions though, you know, we're, we like to stick to no more than an hour and a half, um, per day and with some, with some stuff that they can do on their own. We have found after doing this for almost 10 months that you kind of lose people after that amount of time. And I can speak to that. Um, I'm not very good at sitting in front of my computer for more than an hour and a half either. So, um, you know, we want it to be, um, we want to give them the information, um, and if it's a virtual platform is how we need to do it, we will, um, but we don't want to, we don't want to lose them either. So, um, <clears throat> and again, we would, we would do career interest surveys ahead of time to make sure that those career mentors, um, we make a meaningful match and we have time to um, uh, contact our partners and see, you know, who's available and, and who would be appropriate for that particular person. I just want to throw out there too, um, we are in the process, so one of the things that we're going to be doing in real time is reaching out to different um, prospects as far as employers and just kind of sharing the same thing with them that we're sharing with you that we're really interested if they'd want to be a host site to one of our students. However, if for some reason we're not able to do that because of COVID, we would love if they'd be interested in becoming a career mentor. So if any of you have, um, you know, any recommendations or um, thoughts on placements, I mean, I know obviously some of you are working on your own, so we completely understand that. But if there's ever um, anyone that you have in mind, we would be really open to talking with them because the biggest thing that we try to do, much like OOD, is we really want to make sure that we're pairing them somewhere meaningful, um, something that they're interested in, that they're motivated by, so it's a really good stepping stone as they look at their future and what transition is going to look like. So how to apply. Um, so basically, every consumer needs to complete a Next Steps application, um, but if they are an existing consumer of the Ability Center already, um, they can uh, contact any of the department staff members and we can um, take them through the application to determine eligibility. If, so if this is a new consumer who has not ever received services with the Ability Center, um, they must first complete an intake with us and an eligibility survey. Um, but the, the eligibility survey for our youth services um, is very similar to, um, similar concept to Next Steps, but um, they have to have a goal, most importantly, of independent living. Um, like I said, as the Center for Independent Living, that's our, our main focus. And then those individuals who have also have goals of competitive employment and potentially post-secondary education as well, um, that's, you know, a bonus. And um, so if, if they complete the intake and they're found eligible, uh, then they would also complete a Next Steps application. Um, and in order to access that um, in the Sylvania office, um, anyone would contact uh, Shelby Phillips. She is our um, intake and life skills coordinator. And then um, uh, in the Bryan office, it would be Angie Barton. So um, the Bryan office, we had intended on um, starting up a uh, Next Steps program similar to the one that's here, uh, but obviously COVID threw a wrench in that. So um, 
I know Angie out in the Bryan office is still um, going to have some summer programming. Um, most likely it will be virtual. Um, and you know that is still kind of in the planning process at this point. Um, but anyone, any consumer um, in you know Lucas Wood or Ottawa counties um, that wants more information or is interested if they're not already a consumer is welcome to contact Shelby. And then anyone in the four county area is welcome um, to contact Angie. However, any of us can can help um, if you know these are the people who would do the intakes, um, but anyone in the department really can, can refer and make sure that that connection is made. I just wanted to put out there, we'll be hosting um, parent and family slash guardian um, consumer information nights as well. And um, at the Next Steps information night, they'll actually have an option. We will have a link available that families can just click, click on and apply live. Um, that way they don't have to worry about receiving paperwork, filling out paperwork and sending it back to us. Um, we will have the option that evening when they join the call to actually apply at that time. Thank you, forgot about that. Um, so now I'm gonna move on and talk about our Youth Leadership Forum. Um, so this is a program um, created by Opportunities for Highlands with Disabilities. Um, it was modeled off a of Youth Leadership program, I believe, from California. Um, so there has been a statewide youth leadership forum held by OOD um, for several years. And then last year, they decided to branch out regionally. So we were subcontracted through OSILC to provide it for the Toledo region. Um, <clears throat> it is for 11th and 12th grade high school students with disabilities. And that is current year juniors and seniors. So as of um, December 31st, 2020, if they were a junior or a senior, that um, as far as eligibility goes. Um, last year was our first year hosting, and obviously, you know, we, um, it was our first year, so we were learning anyway, and we had planned for an in-person program, and it ended up being a virtual program, but I think that, you know, we adapted pretty well. Um, it seems to be pretty successful. We had a lot of um, great participants, great delegates, um, and a lot of great community partners and um, it, you know staff from uh, local government that were able to speak to the delegates. Um, so there's there's some modules that um, this program focuses on. I'm going to get to those in a minute, but um, as far as who can participate, it's um, like I said. 11th and 12th grade students who live in Ohio um, and who have a disability and we'll get into the specifics a little more um, but it's it's an interactive program um, we had uh, a lot of guest speakers um, and you know we had um, small group sessions and larger group sessions and I'll show you a, a example of the schedule here in a minute um, and they have actually said, already decided that this year will also be virtual. So um, I think going into that this summer um, is, is going to be good. You know, obviously, I don't think anyone is hoping for virtual at this point. We all want to have that, that glimmer of hope that we can do things in person again someday. But, but I think um, knowing what it's going to be like and having experienced it last year, too, I think that will be helpful going into planning this year's. Um, <clears throat> so throughout the program, um, delegates will learn about choosing a career, history of disability, um, uh, available resources and assist assistive technology, identifying existing barriers to personal and professional success, um, and develop plans to deal with these barriers. So the personal leadership plan is something that they work on throughout the whole week. Um, that's something I didn't mention, I apologize. It might be on another slide here, but um, it will be held, it's a, it's a week long, um, four days. Although last year uh, we did a day of orientation. So technically it was, it lasted all week. Um, and it will be held in June, dates are to be determined, um, but I know it does have to be completed um, by the end of June. But throughout the week, they are, are working on a personal leadership plan, which they get the first day. And it's really just um, a document that helps them outline goals in different areas. Um, and, you know, I think this year we, we will be um, a little more diligent about setting one-on-one -on -one appointments or meetings with uh, those delegates to 
uh, really hash out the details of those personal, personal leadership plans. Um, but again, last year was kind of all, all new to everybody. Um, but I think that overall, all the students did a really great job um, with their goal setting um, in each of the areas that we discussed. Um, and then hopefully by the end of it, you know, they're going to be empowered to reach their goals in education and employment, um, the community, and they'll also be introduced to professionals with disabilities as mentors and role models. So that's something I thought that was really great about YLF is um, all of the speakers were, not all of the speakers, but at least half of the speakers were encouraged to be individuals um, with disabilities themselves. So we had a lot of wonderful um, community advocates and disability rights advocates that spoke to the delegates. Um, and I, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of times when we had emotional reactions from some of the, the delegates um, seeing someone in front of them who had, um, you know, the same or a similar disability and um, has become, you know, so successful. And, you know, there were times, you know, some shared that there were times in their life where they thought that that wasn't a possibility for them. So I think it's really cool to make that connection and to see it happening. <clears throat> Um, so something that, uh, that was kind of um, part of the, the grant to host this was that we were tasked with um, creating a steering committee, um, which was super helpful in the planning process. Um, we had a, an amazing steering committee who helped us so much. Um, we met monthly, at least monthly, um, and they helped with the planning, um, with the delegate selection. You know, they were part of the delegate interviews as well. Um, so this kind of was made up of a bunch of different people, but we were um, assigned an OOD liaison, um, and she was wonderful. Um, and then we had representatives from disability services organi organizations, um, both of Lucas and Wood County boards. Um, we had someone from the site center and deaf services. Um, we had representatives from um, schools as well, both um, post-secondary and secondary schools. Um, advocates and um, different community members. So it was it was a great collection of people, and um, we also had a past um, participant of YLF, um, someone who's been involved in the ability with the Ability Center for a really long time, and he was really great to have that perspective of someone who had been through the program, the statewide one, and was able to offer some suggestions. Um, and you know, he he actually was involved in. Um, some of the sessions in throughout YLF too, which was cool to, um, you know, have someone participate that could really relate to the delegates. Was only a few years older than them and had been in their shoes and been in their position, so that went really well. Um, and I I assume that everything will be similar to last year, and there will be a steering committee again. Um, although this isn't our first year this time, I do think it is beneficial and just um, networking and making those connections. And then, you know, as far as the teachers go, they can they can certainly refer students um, to the program as well if they know someone who they feel is appropriate. Um, so I know we're getting close to time here, but I want to um, just show you an example of the schedule that we had last year. Um, we had our schedule planned and then when it went virtual, we, we adapted. So again, we decided we got some great feedback from someone, um, the leader of Youth Leadership Toledo, to keep our sessions at an hour and a half. So we did that, and it worked out pretty well. So we did a morning session and an afternoon session with um, kind of a, I don't like to really use the word homework, but that's essentially what it was. Gave them um, an activity to complete on their own um, during that break, or you know, if they wanted to do them ahead of time, they were able to. They We mailed them um, a binder full of all um, all the activities, all everything in hard copy format. Um, prior to the event starting, so they had everything that they needed, and then we also emailed it to them in an electronic format. Um, but that worked out pretty well. Um, they did a community service or, or community resource um, website scavenger hunt where they were given specific information to find websites. Um, there's a really cool assistive technology home, um, model home in Wood County, and um, we had, had intended on going there, but we ended up doing a virtual tour. They, they watched some YouTube videos and um, collected information on that. Um, they learned about, you know, assistance dogs and talked a lot about, um, you know, brainstormed some words about empowerment. Um, we also had the wonderful opportunity to have Jennifer Keelan speak to us um, as a group and we kind of, um, you know, just as an advocate 
and I think that was really powerful for the students. Um, so we had a lot of speakers and then we did um, a virtual tour of city council and um, Mayor Kapsikavich spoke to us, which I thought was really great and the students really loved it. Um, and some other um, city officials as well. Um, and then we had a there was also, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lisa. No, I was just gonna mention there was also um, a council member from Mommy who um, is a person with a disability who spoke and I think that was really powerful also for the students to see that there was um, a leader in that type of a position in the community um, with a disability as well. Yes, absolutely, he was great. Um, and then of course we had our executive director, Tim Harrington speak and we had some members of our board speak. Um, that was one of the areas we discussed, you know, was leading in a, in a board setting. Um, and then we had a round table with YLF alumni and other consumers who were in college. Um, and we did some breakout sessions and they got to, to speak to those um, individuals in a, a small group setting. So that was really successful as well. And then, you know, we did some um, training on different life skills that are important um such as financial management and different um, employment skills and then at the end we presented our personal leadership plans um so i think you know we would follow a similar model this year um you know adding in as much as we possibly can to ensure that they they had all of these modules um but also trying to make it engaging and um you know without boring them to death sitting in front of their computer for hours on end so um, it seemed to work out pretty good last year, so I think, you know, that we would do something similar. Um, so again, to reiterate, this is for 11th and 12th grade high school students with disabilities. Um, and again, that is 11th and 12th graders as of December 31st, 2020. Um, <clears throat> so, and these should be individuals who demonstrate leadership potential, um, demonstrate involvement in community or extracurricular activities, demonstrate the ability to interact effectively with other students and are representative of Ohio in terms of geographic uh, region and are OOD eligible. Um, they don't already have to be connected with OOD necessarily. We can make sure that that happens, um, but they do have to be OOD eligible. The other thing to note too, um, just so it's not confusing, in the beginning we mentioned that we service the seven counties and that is um, accurate as far as the Ability Center scope. However, for Youth Leadership Forum, because it is a grant funded project and it is regionalized, we did have some participants from some of the other counties that don't have a SIL in them um, or closer to. So if it's one of the counties that's um, a county that you may serve or work with and they're not within our seven county service area, just check in with us and it may be someone that would still be eligible to participate in the program as long as they're in Ohio and we're the closest still participating in YLF. Um, so how to apply for YLF. Um, any eligible consumer should complete an application and submit to the site coordinator, which is me. Um, and the applications can be obtained through the Ability Center. Um, since this is an OOD program, they can also be um, obtained through OOD. So if, uh, if you know, as um, if, if you know this consumer is already connected with OOD, you can have them ask their counselor. Um, and I know a lot of counselors, you know, they are, they're really great about um, referring individuals on their caseload who they feel are appropriate. Um, but, you know, if you know of a consumer who um, has, you know, hasn't talked about it, definitely mention it if you feel that they're appropriate and they can talk to their counselor. Um, we also got several referrals through schools. Um, now, the, the school referrals were individuals who were already connected with OOD and had a school liaison through OOD. Um, but, you know, some of the students had their teachers help them with the applications and the, the applications actually came from the teachers themselves. So multiple ways to do it. Um, we will have information on our website once, um, we get all of that updated information this spring. Um, but when in doubt, just contact me. Um, I am the, the YLF site coordinator for our region. Um, so I'll help in any way I can. The application um, last year, and I'm assuming it would be similar this year, we don't have 
it officially yet, but it would include personal demographic information, um, school and extracurricular information, um, disability related information, community involvement, and employer ex employment experience. There's also um, uh, letters of recommendation that are required and then a written essay portion as well. Um, as Don said, delegates do not have to be an existing ACT consumer or necessarily in our seven county service area. Um, I know last year, because the statewide one was canceled, uh, I got some referrals that were from an individ individuals who had applied originally for the statewide conference and then were sent to us because we were the closest still. So, um, so yeah, we can definitely um, expand this you know, a little bit out of our normal service area, just as long as they're resident of Ohio. Um, this year, I, I know that they did open it up to more than just the five regions. Um, they opened it up to all SILs. I don't know that all SILs took advantage of that, um, but there's potential for um, it, there to be more regional YLFs. Um, that just hasn't been, um, I, I don't know that information yet. I don't know that if it's public um, knowledge yet. Um, and I think that's all I have. So um, I talked a lot, but we have um, <laughs> seven minutes. And I don't know if we wanted to answer some of the questions. And they get t-shirts. That's always a fun incentive. They do get a polo shirt and a t-shirt, which is always fun. Anytime you get swag, it's always popular. <laughs> yes, swag for both programs, really. We try to um, give them give them swag, give them tools that they can use towards their independent living and employment goals um, for both programs, so. So to answer some of the questions, um, the students do work Monday through Thursday. It's 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. with a um, lunch break. And then another one of the questions, how many of the individuals can participate in the Next Steps program? So for our traditional program, we typically have um, 20 students participate is our max. Um, however, if we do it virtually, we'll be able to be a little more flexible with that number. Um, and then same with Youth Leadership Forum. Um, when we held it, or when we were hoping to hold it in person, 20 was really kind of our goal. But um, again, we can be a little more flexible with a higher number because of the fact that that's definitely going to be held virtually. Any other questions? I don't see any others. Um, but if anyone has a question after this, you can reach out to any of us um, in the youth department. We're happy to answer any questions. Or if you have um, consumers or students that you want to send our way, but you're, you know, even if you're not sure, but you think they might be appropriate, we're happy to um, to talk to those individuals. Um, and you know, go over the program or refer them, certainly refer them to the info night that we're holding, um, the two info nights that we're holding the next couple weeks um, on both of these programs to find out more. And this, like I said earlier, is a recorded session. So if um, you have colleagues that are interested in hearing the information, this will be available to them. Um, and I'm not sure if we mentioned the dates of the information nights for the parents and the delegates um, and consumers, but for Youth Leadership Forum, the info night is actually being held on the evening of Monday, January 11th. Um, so if you have any parents or students who are interested in Youth Leadership Forum, um, that would be that, that information night. And then on Monday, January 25th, is going to be the Next Steps um, information night. So if you have families interested, interested in either of those programs, they can join on those two nights and we will have a Zoom link um, available just like this was for them to register. Great, well thank you all for joining. We really appreciate it and we look forward to our continued collaborations. Thank you.